Hello, welcome to Diminishing Returns. We are doing the long-running horror franchise Child's Play this week, also known as Chucky. It's October, that that basically means it's horror movie month, which is something I'm on board with. And yes, we're, we're kicking off horror month with Child's Play. Quite obviously, this episode contains spoilers for... Child's Play, Child's Play 2, Child's Play 3, Bride of Chucky, Seed of Chucky, and Curse of Chucky. Enjoy. This week we are getting into the... Uh, festive? That's only for Christmas, isn't it? We're getting into the <laughs> holiday spirit for uh, Halloween a little bit early with uh, a look at the Child's Play series of films tying into the upcoming... Which one's this, Calvin? Cult of Chucky, yes, Cult is it of now? Chucky, yes, Cult of Chucky, yes. Cult of Chucky. Yeah, it's a, a surprisingly vast film series, this one, the Child's Play series, uh, better known as the Chucky series to layman's. With me, as always, is Calvin, who you just heard, and Alan, who's uh, he's not a good guy doll. <laughs> if anything, he's a, a bad guy. A naughty man doll. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> oh, and who are you? Oh, and I'm Sol. Oh, hello, okay. All right, hello, Sol. And I'm your friend to the end. Oh, I, 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 I had a hugs. great Jennifer Tilly impression lined up for this, and you just sort of <laughs> skirted over me, like, oh, that's Calvin. <laughs> <laughs> well, you spoke already. Go on, give us your Jennifer Tilly then. I, I, I this will be interesting. Hello, boys. <laughs> <laughs> Let me try that again because that was. <clears throat> so, I mean, it's about as good as it could have been, I suppose. <laughs> <laughs> so, child's play. Have we all been brushing up on our our child's play rewatching the films or watching them for the first time or well i i actually marathoned them apart from the first one which Sol, i believe you showed me the first one at university because you knew that i was quite into all of these slasher films and oh. i'd never actually seen the child's play films and i think i saw the first that one back right. at university didn't care for it very much and then about this time last year actually i marathoned all of the six uh, movies huh well, you see, this is the thing, we we often got onto slasher films as a topic of conversation at uni, because you're a big, big fan of them. You, mm. Well, no, both of us, actually, are big horror fans. Mm. You're a big, big slasher fan. Yes. Whereas for me, slasher is kind of the one area of horror that just doesn't really do it for me, and, and the mm. vast majority of slasher films really leave me cold and don't do it for me. Mm. But for some reason... Child's Play is the exception to the rule, mm. and I do really like these films. Not to get ahead of ourselves, but I, I, I have a, a big soft spot for them, and I don't, I don't know what it is about them that works for me, whereas the other films don't. Mm. Um, I really like half of them. Yeah. Uh, we'll get into which ones. Well, but, uh, that's what about interesting you, because I, I, I mean, I, I only really like one of them, but then the rest are all <laughs> huh. in the like the sort of you know, when a horror film isn't actually good, but it's just like really watchable yes, and yes. kind of comforting. They're all in that category Oof. for me. Mm. Uh, okay. So, yeah. Well, I, I hadn't seen them before. Obviously, I was okay. aware of them, but I didn't really know. I didn't know there were so many of them. I didn't know to what extent it went. So I was pretty much blind going into this. Mm. Uh, but it's interesting, so the way you talk about it, because the way this film sort of goes in terms of the first one being sort of a legitimate kind of horror attempt, and then the next and the next one's being a much more sort of self conscious, slightly tongue in cheek. It did remind me of Evil Dead. Hmm. Um, oh, obviously, really? not to that extent, um, or certainly not to the quality that. <laughs> Sam Raimi can bring, but um, uh, but it reminded me of that in terms of the tone. Uh, so huh. perhaps you you picked That's up on that as well, subconsciously yeah. somewhere. Uh, but yeah, f so for me, this was my first time going in. So. Oh, hmm. well, that's interesting. I mean, the, one thing I'll say is the first time I watched Child's Play, I think it was one of the first horror films I uh, I rented out. I think I rented it from Love Film back when I started 
that, which is, you know, sadly probably not going to be with us uh, by the time this episode comes out, or... I think October 31st is the last day of it. Oh, okay. It was one of the first films that I rented on there, if I recall correctly, and that's because I suddenly had access to this world of horror films that... I previously didn't really have access to. It was it was one of the first horror films I went to. I think it was the first killer doll movie, which is obviously a, a subgenre in its own right now, that I went to, kind of viewing it as the definitive killer doll movie. No, I don't know, um, there must have been stuff and I, about well, no, I, killer that, that's, ventriloquist that's ha- uh, dolls. Um, oh, there was that Michael Redgrave film in the 50s, what was it called? The Dead of Night or something like that? Yeah, I mean, that's the thing. I at, at the time, my point is, at the time, I viewed it as the definitive killer doll movie before right. I'd actually seen it. Now I've seen it, I don't think it necessarily is. Because, um, as you say, there's these other films. There's Magic with Anthony Hopkins. There's, ah, yes. Um, there's, loads of, there's loads of them. Mm. Um, and obviously there's the Twilight Zone episodes where it all all began, as always. Mm. As a young'un, I, I wasn't as familiar with that, and I just sort of knew the most famous one. And I'd say Chucky is, uh, I'd say, still the most famous killer doll, even though there's all these Annabelle movies nowadays. Yeah, um, Chucky and Annabelle. Um, but e- even then, I wouldn't necessarily put Chucky in like the um, the top tier, you know, slashers. Like I don't think he's necessarily um, a peer of Jason or Freddy or Michael Myers or even Leatherface well, for that matter. I think he's a B-list slasher. Yeah. I think yeah. he's someone McFarlane Toys probably got round to in their second run <laughs> of figures. Yeah, I think so. I know what you're saying. He's he's above pumpkin head and things like that. Mm. He is, uh, you know, eminently merchandisable. Mm. Uh, he does render well as yeah. a doll. So yeah. <laughs> that kind of makes it all easier. But yeah, the thing is, when I first watched it, I wasn't that blown away by it. But for whatever reason, I've come back to it repeatedly, hmm. and I've grown over the years to just absolutely love it. I, I think it's a really great little horror movie, just great fun. Uh, there's just something about it really clicks with me. I don't really, I can't quite put my finger on what it is that it does so well, but it's a very similar experience, I think, to films like Fright Night. Uh, yeah. If you've ever seen the original Fright Night, that's from the same era. It's got Chris Sarandon in it as well, actually, thinking about it. Uh, and it's tonally not completely removed as well, but it, it, it's not amazing, but it's very... You kind of grow to love it with uh, <laughs> a few repeat viewings. It's it's weird, and I really think this is... I don't know, it, it, it's a weird one, because it, it sounds like you went through a similar phase Calvin. i mean I, w- I wouldn't be surprised if it's still your least favorite of the lot the first one but i think you like the first one now don't you I, I i don't mind it um certainly of the first three i think it's the best but um i, I much prefer the series when it just goes sort of crazy mm. a bit further down the line but we'll, we'll yeah. get there i rewatched the entire series for the sake of this podcast episode anyway um mm. i'd watched them all before but I had only watched the sequels once each before, ah. so this was my second viewing. Oh, interesting. Okay. Well, I guess a, qu- a quick summary of this first one would be that um, Brad Dourif is, is playing a, a character known as the Lakeshore Strangler. and um, Charles Lee Ray. Charles Lee Ray. And he's being pursued by a policeman played by Chris Sarandon, and um, he is injured and dying, and he transfers his soul via a voodoo curse or something into a doll. He's in a toy shop. And then the doll gets bought by a mother who gives it to a kid, and then the doll starts making the kid do naughty things and killing people, and, you know, as you'd expect. This the film came out in 1988, which is much later than I in my memory. Um, yeah, it came out. I don't know if I, I'd kind of lump it in with these other sort of known you know, slasher films that all began in the late 70s and early 80s. And the idea that this one is, I always lump it in as a as a mid 80s yeah thing, yeah. very much part of the 80s. I'm always amazed that it was really as a franchise it was more of a 90s thing obviously yeah. it started in the 80s but it, it it seemed to have its life on home video and sequels and what have you in the 90s really so 
Yeah, yeah exactly. But I, I think that's just interesting to think that it was sort of starting up as other big, like, um, until Scream came in in the mid-90s and rejuvenated the genre, a lot of the other slasher films were kind of winding down or becoming too ridiculous around this point. Like, I think, uh, what, like, mm. Friday the 13th was uh, part 8, and uh, Nightmare <laughs> on Elm Street was at, like, part 5 or something. They were all jumping sharks and whatnot, and then this comes out. Yeah, which is much more grounded and sensible. <laughs> <laughs> You're saying that as a joke, Alan, but I mean, I think there's an argument to be made that it is. The first one is, compare that to these films Calvin's been mentioning, Friday the 13th and Nightmare on Elm Street and stuff. They are very just gung-ho, there's a madman killing people, and the Mm. first Child's Play, I think... I think its reputation precedes it, and I think a lot of people don't realise what it is exactly, and I think Mm. I always forget just how much it plays itself as kind of a almost like a psychological thriller for the first half it's it mm. it really for for anyone who hasn't seen it for a lot of the runtime at the start the film is ambiguous as to whether or not chucky is even alive mm. or if it's all in the head of this little boy and he's just killing people that's interesting actually Saul. if i can jump in there because yeah. when i was making some notes my first note is basically are we supposed to be in any doubt about whether or not it's the doll? Hmm. Because it seemed to be that way from the way it was filmed and it was like you were you were getting flashes of something. Like, was it the kid? Hmm. He's wearing the same clothes. But and I don't know, maybe it's because you're going in knowing it's the doll. I'm aware of the Well, that's it. There, there is a picture of the doll stabbing at you on the box. Yeah, exactly. There was never any doubt. And I don't know if I... Maybe maybe that's just because I knew. But it, 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 that was lost on me, that element of possible suspense. I, I, but I would have liked that. I would have liked it if we'd have had the ambiguity yeah. throughout the whole thing. You know, is it just mm. a mental kid? Mm. That's... But I, I like that. And I think regardless of whether or not we're meant to know as an audience, the fact that it's played that way means that you're put in the shoes of the mother. You're you're basically seeing it from Karen's point of view. And this is another thing, because Andy Barkley, the, the little boy, kind of became the human hero protagonist of the series certainly for a while but the mother is very much the protagonist of the first film it's Mm. her film and it's it's she's the hero and i think frankly i think it's really sad she didn't come back for any of the sequels because i i really like her character i think she's a great well-written character Mm. i mean that's no disrespect to to andy barkley either the the character because i think that kid in uh in the first film, I think that is a remarkably good performance from such a young oh, yeah. child actor. Definitely. And he doesn't necessarily grow into <laughs> being a brilliant actor as the series progresses, <laughs> but but he has a real charm in the first film. Mm. Well, I think you raise an interesting point about the... Uh, we are supposed to empathise with the mother in this one. I suppose she's the main character, really. Um And I think that goes kind of contradictory to a lot of other horror franchises, just to make another comparison, which are all about teenagers and young adults. And uh, here we have a sort of, I mean, she's a young mother. I guess she must be like early to mid thirties and... Yeah, but she but she's a single a single mother. Yeah, it, yeah, sort even of struggling more struggling to not struggling to make ends meet, but she you know she she's working her job and trying to look after the kid, and she wants to the whole plot of the film is put into action because she wants to get him this expensive toy mm. for his birthday that he wants. Mm. Is it his birthday or Christmas? Uh, no, it's his birthday, isn't it? I can't remember. It is it's his birthday because it opens with him making breakfast in bed for his mum because it's his birthday and I always thought that was a really weird thing to do because <laughs> the film opens if you remember on this bizarre sequence of the kid making like cereal with orange juice and yes. ice cream on toast and yeah, it's this yeah. hideous like concoction but y- you get this sense of childlike you know that that's something a kid might do and and again i think mm. it's a really great bit of characterization that this sort of franchise generally wouldn't bother with yes that you see yeah. this kid doing this lovely gesture for his mum even though she doesn't you know and that's the thing she sees it and she sort of goes oh and you can see in her face oh god i've got to clean up this mess but <laughs> he means well and it's it's just it's yeah. a lovely way to open a film and, mm. and most of these films would open on uh, I mean, I suppose they open with Charles Lee Ray getting killed, but um, mm. 
there's a nice mixture. I, I think one of the reasons this film does work for me so well is that it it has such strong characters and it's so grounded in the characters and mm. it's not just people getting picked off and a, a body count accruing. It's yeah. it's your heroes that you're following and a few people die along the way. But well, in, interesting there, Sol. You you said you said about the tone of this film. What one of my notes is I don't get what this film is supposed to be. It's not a horror, but it's not a comedy. What, what is it trying to do? <laughs> Because from, from this, it felt to me like it was going for that, it's so bad, it's good market. Um, no, but the, no, the fact that it was deliberately no, trying to do it, it meant that it was just shit. It's it's not a comedy, but it's got a sense of humour. Yes. I, I think it's obviously meant to be scary, so it definitely falls into the horror Is category. It? But it it's meant to be. <laughs> okay. And, and you know, there, there's something to be said for the opening half hour or so when you don't know if it's actually a killer doll or if it's this child Mm. it's halfway through the film and this moment happens where the doll is revealed to be actually magic and chucky i mean essentially the doll's talking then she looks at the box and then there's some batteries in it batteries included and she realizes the batteries haven't been put in the doll and Mm. she has to slowly like pick it up look in the back to check that there's no batteries in there and you just you you know obviously she's going to open it up. There's no batteries. The doll's going to attack her. But I I think that whole sequence is played so well. Yeah. Um, up until he attacks her, at which point it just becomes silly. But hey ho. I think one of the reasons this one does work for me is that it's kind of a slasher film without the the slasher element. Almost it th- there's mm. there's very little gore in this film when people do die. It's never really like oh cool look at all that blood and pus that Mm. that isn't really you barely see anything with the majority of the deaths and yeah it's just it's not that gory or or unpleasant in that sense as i said before it's really character driven i think the lack of uh creative kills and deaths is probably one of the things holding me back from really liking this film i still don't even like (laughs) i've seen this one probably the most out of all the series and it's uh it's really not my favorites in in, amongst my favorites i think this one really is the it's the only one in the series that's like a real film (laughs) and the others are just kind of slasher films or they're fucking crazy as the as the <laughs> series progresses but <laughs> should we talk about the uh, the ending of the film if we're ready to get go there yeah i i really like the fact that uh chris sarandon the the policeman helping mrs barkley i, I really like that he gets drawn into the main plot and that there's mm. this sort of police presence because I, I don't know, it's weird. A lot of these sorts of films, you always end thinking, right, well, uh, that character's going to walk back to civilization or go and find help. They'll be accused of murder. That's the end of the road for them. Like, they'll be thrown in an asylum. It, it's often played like a happy ending that they've burnt the house to the ground or killed all these zombies or whatever. And mm. it's always this, this underlying element of, but obviously this is the end of their like life in all for all intents and purposes, even though they survive. And the fact that he's there, I think the film has a real sense of him and his friend, the other copper who shows up. There's Mm. a real sense of, okay, these two policemen have seen it, and therefore it's going to be okay. And even though that's kind of ludicrous, and I don't know how well it would actually play out in real life, you can totally buy the idea of, no, these guys have seen it, and they'll write up a report, and they'll make this go away, and it'll be all right. And I, I think that's mm. quite, it's quite nice and refreshingly different for this sort of film because, like I say, they so often end with this unintentional downbeat element mm. about the ending. Well, I like that they have to keep them around to sort of tell the tale that, oh yeah, the doll is actually alive. It adds an extra layer of, um, well, uh, tension, I suppose, to the ending, because not only am I not wanting these characters to die because I like them, I also need them to stay alive because I need enough people to corroborate yeah. the the story yeah. and that Karen yeah. and Andy aren't going to be locked away forever. But yeah, because Chucky's whole plan, we haven't mentioned it yet, but Chucky's whole plan throughout the course of the film is to, this, this voodoo nonsense, he has to transfer his soul into Andy's body if he wants to be in a human body again, because... That's it, he goes to see the, the voodoo man, and the voodoo yes. man tells, because he because he's bleeding after being attacked, and the man tells him, oh, your, your, your body's becoming more human, so mm. uh, the longer you wait, eventually you'll be trapped in this body permanently mm. with like a human heart and blood running mm. through it somehow, so you need to 
steal a human host body, mm. basically, b- before time's up. And Andy is the only one because he's the first one that he spoke to? Is that it? Mm. He, he's the first one yeah. he revealed his secret to, the fact that he was Charles Lee Ray. So yeah, I think basically the first one he spoke to, the first one he let know he wasn't very just a tenuous doll. but uh, yeah i mean I but again like, that is the sort of thing where i'll go okay this is the rules of this story world that they're setting up i can go with it do you know what i mean it's it's yeah. just like okay that's good enough for this yeah. Sort of film yeah and and they're, they're they're i mean it's quite a contrived set of rules but it serves the story well um yes. <clears throat> and it serves the sequels quite well as well mm. it, it justifies them delving back into the story of andy rather than picking up with new characters. Should we jump onto the second film here? Or? <laughs> yeah, shall we? Because, uh, <laughs> yeah, it's an interesting beginning to this one. I always find it quite mm. curious. Uh, at the end of the first one, Chucky is completely destroyed, uh, pretty much. And Yeah, the it, it, it's like the melted second... down, burn, torn yes. apart. Like, and the... <laughs> shot about four times. <laughs> and the start <laughs> yeah. of the second one is the toy company who makes the um, the good guy dolls rebuild that exact doll from <laughs> scratch using the original mm-hmm. parts i you know assume to prove that there is no fault with the dolls <laughs> and that they're not going to kill other people immediately my impression of the second film was this feels bigger it feels like more mm. open like because you've got this big factory scene it's all like painted bright colors like factories always are um, <laughs> and because <laughs> it's a toy factory right it's fun we pick up with Andy Barkley however many years later that the film was. So the actor's aged because it's the same kid. And he's being put in a, a, a home. Because now he has these um, foster parents. One of them played by an actress that I know, Jenny Agatha. Yeah, uh, what is Jenny Agatha doing in this film? <laughs> it is an doing? odd, um, yeah, very, very odd casting decision. Uh, and choice for her to make. It's a weird, just the setup of this this foster home is bizarre. Yeah. He's brought into this house and they're playing it like it's a couple adopting a child, like they can't mm. conceive or whatever, or they want to adopt. But it's played like he's going to be their kid. And then he gets there to this residential home. It's played like, oh, they, they say you can have the old room that this other kid was in. There's a kid next door who's just kind of using it as a home. And it's not really, they never play it like we're foster parents. It's like, oh, you're it's staying. It's like a hotel for kids. Yeah, yeah, it, it, it's kind of an odd vibe. It, it never, it, it doesn't really look like a foster home. But well, then... these these two characters really uh, confuse me. The the foster parents. I'm I'm not sure if this is good writing or bad writing because they are yeah. pre- <laughs> they are presented as quite like I'm used to slasher films being very black and white. You either like people or you don't. There isn't this kind of grayness. And with these two, I feel like they are very grey. They're not entirely yeah. likable, but at the same time, I'm not rooting for them to die. The dad's bizarre, because the dad's played like, yeah, the husband's played like this sort of reluctant, oh, well, we'll have another kid if you want kind of thing. But then it's like, no, you're you're running a foster home. <laughs> yeah, you think he'd be, yeah, that's, that's what you're doing. This, do you know what this plays? It plays like, in the script, it was Karen, is that the, the mother's name? Yeah. This plays like, oh, Karen's gone into a, a mental home, so Karen's sister and husband have had to take the kid in. Yeah. And they don't really have that good a relationship with them. So, like, they've had to suddenly, they've got this kid on their hands, and, like, he's he's like, oh, it's not even my nephew. I don't give a shit about him. And she's like, mm. oh, no, it's my... Like, that's what it felt more like, rather than two people who kind of take in troubled kids for, like, a living and, and help them. Because, yeah. yeah, it just... Like, he, he is immediately like, oh, I don't know about this kid. He definitely looked a bit funny at that doll. Uh, Ooh, um, <laughs> something, something a bit weird about him. Do you know about this backstory? You know all that mur- the, the doll murder thing. Yeah, very, very <laughs> strange. Uh, yeah. So apparently, apparently they know. One thing I really like with this uh, film and this series, I suppose, for the first few is that with with this sort of film, the the sequel is you pick up with a load of new characters and they get picked off by the doll for whatever reason they felt that they just needed to keep pushing forward with the same story set up in the first film so it's re- mm. it really is like part two of the same thing in a sense oh, very much, yeah, yeah. With, i don't know i just think it's more interesting than than just wiping the slate clean because yeah you can do that later on when you're 
when you're done exploring uh, the fallout of everything and I, this mm. franchise does I suppose later on but yeah I, I think as far as these kind of horror films go this the continuity in the Chucky series is um, probably the most uh, intertwined and well thought out and yeah. uh, revisited of any of these kinds of films and, and I think that's that's probably partly because they've all every last one of them to date has been written by Don Mancini Yes, um, and mm. I don't know. Is that is that normal for a horror franchise like this to no. have one writer throughout? No, or? and I, I was I was gonna point I was gonna point this out actually that not not just him but also the producer like the guy behind it all that came mm-hmm. up, you know that put it together. It's the same all the way through. And considering how different these films go and how different tonally they go, the fact that it's the same people behind it all the time is really odd. I, I think it's an evolution that makes sense when you know the context around it each time. I, I, I yeah. Uh, so anyway, the the sequel, the first sequel, for me, it felt very unextraordinary, very standard sequel. And my, one of my biggest sort of problems with it was all the killings were like he distracts someone and makes them like look over in a cupboard and then like jumps on them from behind and hits them with a hammer. Yes, it, like it was all very samey, very boring kit murders. One thing I don't like with the series is the idea that Chucky is like strong. <laughs> He's like a tiny <laughs> little doll, and you'd think you could just drop kick him, but he seems to be able to take down full grown adults with ease can you guys guess what my favorite thing about this particular film is when he when she blows him in, up to a balloon <laughs> <laughs> he basically does evil dead he chops his hand off and he sticks a knife in it and it's like oh, yeah, oh, of course, of course. Yeah, but but then yeah. but then he gets pushed into like a a part of the factory machinery that's operational, running at night with uh, uh, just one security guard. <laughs> yes. Doesn't really make any sense. Uh, but yeah, he gets pushed into that, and it's just like attaching doll legs and stuff to him, and it's this weird thing. And I I was watching it, just wishing he was going to emerge as this kind of multi-limbed octopus style <laughs> monstrosity but I mean, he comes he comes out like a kind of melted blob they go halfway there yeah <laughs> but just the very ending because it ends with andy and um his foster sister uh teenager and they defeat chuck and then they leave the factory and it ends on such a downbeat note where andy's like um they say we're gonna go home and then andy says where is home and the girl responds that she doesn't know and then that's mm. the end. It's sort of just this... <laughs> where we're going, we don't need home. <laughs> but it's just sort of strangely, just these again, like tonally for this, uh, this film, tonally for me feels more out of whack than probably any of the others in the series. And maybe it's the characterization. It's just I don't know how to feel about a lot of these characters. I don't know whether I'm supposed to feel happy that Jenny Agatha has been killed because i don't know whether i'm supposed to like her or not isn't it odd that chucky kills her full stop because what's what's the motive for doing that at that point her husband has been killed and she's just we have a scene where she's obviously very distraught and playing it like jenny agatha is a very good actress and she's playing it quite realistically as you would if your spouse was killed so i i feel bad for her at that point she's basically kicked andy out back to the authorities anyway hasn't she she said i don't want him anymore so there's this, there's this weird scene where they just kill her for no reason, and later on in the franchise they establish Chucky, Charles Lee Ray, as a, someone who just enjoys killing. But at this point mm. he's played like far more of a sensible guy who kills with purpose. Yeah, he's, he's, he's working to an end goal of getting this kid, isn't he? So, so the second film, exactly what I was saying before, very entertaining and watchable, even though it's not actually very good. Yeah. That kind of just enjoyable shit horror <laughs> yeah I, I i i'd agree with that well i mean yeah i mean i didn't i didn't care for it particularly but in the same way as we've already discussed for the first one because it doesn't tickle my buttons as as the same way it does you it's uh it's just not uh, it just doesn't have the same effect on me but um immediately after that it was like the next year chucky uh three came out or child's play three rather i should say mm. but it takes place eight years in the future yeah. Uh, the Play Pals factory, the company that make the good guys doll, um, apparently they just closed it for <laughs> eight years and didn't remove any of the uh, plastic or uh, any of the machinery. They just closed the doors for eight years and now they're 
bringing back the good guy doll after a hiatus due to the bad publicity. Now, the film opens again. This is another sort of curious choice. Um, the film opens with Chucky going and killing the Play Pals, uh, the head of the Play Pals thing, who's this, like, rich old guy who lives, you know, works in a big, uh, high-rise building and plays yeah. golf and all that sort of stuff. I, I get, I don't know how I'm supposed to feel about this, because I feel like the yeah. film expects me to hate this man I, I have, and I've blame made the same him note. <laughs> in some way, but he's not responsible for... He's only being negligent in a world where magic exists. <laughs> so, <laughs> and, and he doesn't, he believes magic doesn't exist because he's meant to be a normal person. This is meant to be an yeah. absurd happening, you know, in, a, in the real world. And so, yeah, it doesn't work, does it? It doesn't play at all like it's meant to. Cause, well, yeah, because I think we are supposed to think of him as some kind of villain, but it's like he's not actually doing anything wrong. If he knew that the doll was actually evil and going to kill people, yes. and then he yeah. went ahead with it anyway, then yeah, fair enough. But that's not what happens. He's just a normal businessman who's like, yeah. look, some kid went mental with a doll, but that's not really anything to do with us, is it? And it, it, it's, it's got some weird parallels with uh, what happened in real life with this film. Yeah, I was just going to say that, actually. Yeah. Uh, just out of interest, after watching this film, you guys, did either... Did either of you feel compelled to go out and uh, abduct and murder any any children? Well, no more than usual. <laughs> <laughs> Why? What, what? What's the thing? <laughs> well, this film, like this film, was the center of a, a big controversy uh, in the nineties. Uh, Jamie Bulger. Jamie Bulger. That was it. Are you, are you familiar with the Jamie oh, Bulger case, Carmen? Yeah, he was a little boy, and two other sort of slightly older boys took him away and murdered him. And the, you know, the, obviously this horrible, tragic thing happened. These these yeah, older kids abducted this younger child and, and were just awful and killed him, basically. Uh, the Daily Mail then picked up that the parents of one of the kids had rented Child's Play 3. They, uh, they tied him to train tracks, I believe, as part of what they mm -hmm. did to him. And they were like, train tracks, train tracks. Oh, at the end of Child's Play 3, there's a roller coaster... And at one point, a character sort of runs across the roller coaster tracks. They were obviously influenced by Child's Play 3. Blame Child's what? Play 3. Ban this sick filth. And uh, they started this campaign. The film became really notorious as this horrible, unpleasant, gory film, even though it isn't, really. No, and not at all. a load of people that have never watched it uh, condemned it very unfairly. And I hate the news media. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so unfairly, the Child's Play franchise was sort of tarnished with this brush, and a lot of people view it as being culpable for the murder of a, a young child, which is very unfair, God. because, you know, the, the, these aren't sadistic films, and there are sadistic films no. out there, and, and as we say, we'll be covering a, a, a far more sadistic franchise that <laughs> hasn't been blamed for anything uh Next week, are we um are we all in agreement that this is the low point of the series? Uh, no. Oh, okay, then that's interesting. I mean, it's not. It's it's certainly a low point. If anything, not by much, but I'd say I'd probably prefer this to number two. Really? Just because I kind of I like that they just go in a completely different area. It's like no, oh yeah, we're setting it in this army college. We've got one. It's all sort of set in one nice kind of neat location. I I like the concept. I guess. Um, yeah, there was. I think the concept worked. Uh, whether it was well executed or not, it was just the same as the others. It was just kind of mm. yeah, same, same old, same old. You know when they give the kid a, a military haircut? Yes. Oh, we need to talk about that barber. Is that a military haircut? Because it didn't look like one. It looked like <laughs> quite a, quite a long, stylish nineties do <laughs> that he ended up with. What the fuck is up with that barber? <laughs> That's subtle like, character acting. <laughs> he is probably my favourite thing in the film, because he's just so bonkers. Like, I really don't... Is he really getting off on the kids? Um, like, cutting the kids' hair? I, I don't know. It's... Yeah. <clears throat> this barber character, he picks up the Chucky doll, starts cutting its hair, or going to cut its hair, and it's played like he's about to be grisly murdered by Chucky. After all this build-up, he just has a heart attack. No, that's not the barber. That's the, um... Oh, the Colonel. Oh, it is shit. Colonel Cochrane. Yeah, I'm mis I'm confusing it. Yeah, it's no, it's it's weird when um when they when they do his death because it's this this whole build up of Chucky's gonna kill him. It's gonna be horrible, and then he just has this 
heart attack. Yeah. It's, it's this weird, like, meta anti joke of a slasher kill yeah. almost. It's very weird. <laughs> I really liked it. I, yeah, I do. Because Chucky's disappointed that he doesn't get to kill him. Yeah. But I just, I, I don't think I've ever seen that in a, a slasher film where it's like, oh, they just die of natural causes before the mm. killer gets to actually kill them. And then at the end of the film, Chucky explodes like the shark in Jaws 4, <laughs> just for no reason. Yeah, it's, yeah. But, I mean, it really was a kind of set of diminishing returns, I think, this franchise for the first mm. three. It, it kind of came back yeah. smaller each, well, not smaller, but it, it felt like the budget was going down, certainly by the third film, and they were just kind of going out with a whimper by the end of it. But then... They came back for a fourth film. I believe this was hot on the heels of the slasher renaissance of the late 90s. Calvin, you might yes. be a bit... Or th- this is the biggest budget of the series, I should add, for this film. $25 million. Yeah, and I, I get the impression that they just got a shitload of money off the back of the success of Scream and films like I Know What You Did Last Summer and what have you that were all riding mm. the, the new revived interest in the genre. And suddenly we were given this sort of, I guess, a reboot, really, to use modern terminology on it. Um, yeah. Bride of Chucky, the, the child's play mm. name had been dropped. Uh, everyone knew that I mean, was Chucky, reboot. so... <laughs> Tonally, I would say reboot, but continuity-wise, it still follows. I mean, it becomes more apparent later on, but it still follows the continuity. Yeah, it's it's very much the same continuity and what have you, but it it's starting afresh insofar as you don't need to have seen any of the previous films to really get it. It helps if you've seen the first yeah. one, certainly, because this is very mm. much Chucky is suddenly a much bigger driving force in terms of the character i guess he's not just out to he's more of a protagonist or an anti-hero in this than he ever has been before and he's still Mm. he's still not the hero but you're asked to view him as more than just a, a a killer yeah so yeah this is bride of chucky and they just kind of embrace how camp and silly the series is and and start mm. going for broke with it and this one this one is a horror comedy i think quite categorically Oh yeah, yeah, totally. Mm. The proper gags and set pieces for both horror and comedy, well, so, and so so referential and so kind of self aware that it, it's perhaps a bit too much. <laughs> but the uh, the acting in this one is shit. <laughs> <laughs> what <laughs> really like cons- consistently for everyone? I think it's it's appropriate. Uh... We we're treated to a um, a few known actors which makes a change from the the other films so far here so uh mm. you've got a young Catherine heigl before she mm. became a, a star and she is pretty bad uh <laughs> but I, I don't think that's necessarily her fault all the young kids are quite bad there's a really camp character who's quite all right actually who's their friend that there's these kind of two oh, the gay guy yeah there's these two teens who are awful and they're like in love and then there's their best mate <laughs> yeah, who's this really is. gay guy and he's fine he, he gets away but with I, I, like, I like the the bit in the in that where he's meeting the dad ostensibly <laughs> as her date and he's and he's like oh yeah i'm going uh i'm going to study what was he studying like interior decorating or something <laughs> on, yeah. on a on a figure skating scholarship <laughs> and it's like oh he's the gay guy i get it <laughs> and then we've got John Ritter as the dad, which is yes. miscast. I, I, I just I just couldn't buy him as a bad guy. Like, yeah, it just doesn't work. Right. It just didn't work. It doesn't work at all. I thought he it. was great and horrible. Yeah, he's too friendly looking. He's yeah, he's just he's horrible. He's, I think I'm just too used to him as the friendly kind of dad who sets rules but oh he'll get around them somehow <laughs> so <laughs> so then he actually sort of tries to murder them it's a bit yeah <laughs> or set him up for you know drug use and send him to prison that's like hang on he wouldn't do that on eight simple rules <laughs> <laughs> Cassina jimmy turns up later on as a oh, yeah what is she doing in this <laughs> is she just friend with the, one of the actors or something <laughs> 
she must have been like for her to come in. Not that I'm saying that she's a huge star, but a recognizable face to come in for such a strange bit part is peculiar. What about Alexis Arquette as the weird guy who gets <laughs> smothered to death in a weird sex scene? Yeah. <laughs> what about that character? And then, of course, this film introduces us to a new character who's become a big part of the franchise overall. Uh, Tiffany, yeah, played by Jennifer mm. Tilly. The real success story of this film, really, adding that character in and making oh, it yes. work. Yeah. She brings so much to the whole thing. I oh, mean, yeah. I can't even imagine. She's she's yeah. yeah, she's the best thing about the film, frankly. Um and yeah, so we we meet her as a human girlfriend of Charles Lee Ray or ex-girlfriend and uh she's yes. basically trying to research into bringing him back to life with some of his voodoo and the doll and this and that and uh what is it? eventually she basically gets hold of the actual doll from an evidence locker all the kind of pieces mm-hmm. yes. of the chucky doll and does a weird voodoo ritual to bring it back to life again and mm-hmm. yes that sets the wheels in motion and they have a, a weird kind of dysfunctional relationship that ends with mm. chucky killing her and putting her soul into a uh, female doll and they end up being a... But how does he kill her? Like, I love that whole bit. She's taking a bath uh, in a this uh, on trailer. The nose, isn't it? That she's and she's watching, and she's Bride watching Frankenstein. She's watching Bride of Frankenstein, of course, just to make it obvious. Yes. <laughs> yes, it's just brilliant. in case you missed the reference. Oh, I, 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 and a, Chucky is a, going for, and there's a bit of a tussle, and then he pushes the TV into the water, and which electrocutes her, just as uh, the Bride of Frankenstein is, you know, hissing at the end of the film. I loved it. I thought it was so good. <laughs> I I think it's a bit on the nose. I don't know. It's... Yeah, of course it is, and that's fine. It's like. Mm. Maybe it's not Jennifer Tilly so much as the chemistry that um, Chucky mm. and Tiffany have in the film. And it's it's remarkable how much chemistry they have to say they're either both animatronic puppets or one animatronic puppet and a human, depending on which part of the film you're watching. But they really mm. like have a good on-screen chemistry. It's, it's bizarre how well it works. And, and there, there's yeah. something, the animatronic work, the puppetry in this film is a big step up from uh oh yes from the mm-hmm. the previous well the previous three to be honest um because i think technology yeah. had, had progressed and money had gone up and what have you i mean i just find it bizarre from uh, like I, I can't think of another film where because like it's not as if i don't think katherine heigl and her boyfriend are supposed to be the lead characters necessarily i think chucky and tiffany are very much the leads of this film yeah and for both of them to be dolls uh, i mean it's... i think katherine heigl and the boyfriend probably had to be there for a studio to okay it yes, for the budget and say definitely. right there's your human protagonist fine definitely but i mean these kind of films like even in like you know other slashes the killer is not the main character. Like, mm. the killer doesn't go on an emotional journey. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Not that Chucky does here necessarily, but Tiffany very much does, and it's... Uh... And, and yeah, I think that really sets this one apart from, like you say, other slasher films. I think this film is the best, for me, of the series. I would argue that the next one is my favourite, <laughs> but this <laughs> one's the best. <laughs> I, 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 I think this is by far the best of the sequels. I, I prefer the first film. I, I think, like I say, I think it's more of a real film but this is a weird little gem that kind of found its way out i mean the thing is like i i enjoy it but it's still not it's a shame it isn't better it's a shame they didn't get like a real comedy writer to write some real jokes for it because instead most of the gags are very weak (laughs) really uh (laughs) there's some good jokes in there but it's kind of a it's a shame it isn't more than what it is there is a lot of just Chucky swearing and being sadistic yeah. and saying violent things, and that's the joke that it's a doll saying these things. But yeah, uh, no, I love it. Uh, easily my favorite of the series, and uh, I, I I love it so much. It's a, the kind of film that I wish I could have made. <laughs> <laughs> I love that bit where a stoned guy sees Chucky and he's like, "Whoa!" <laughs> <laughs> I wish they'd done more with that. That's one of my favourite things. That's on par with a, a tramp taking a swig from a bottle of some alcohol and like <laughs> just looking oh, at the I... label and spitting out. 
They they should start I putting did. that in more films. You have a stone guy <laughs> just going like, whoa. whoa. <laughs> I did notice actually that when I was looking on IMDb, the guy who plays that character is called Park Bench. <laughs> I don't know if that's his real name, or you know. <laughs> they should edit him into every film ever made. That'd be so good. <laughs> Star Wars, uh, the Death Star explodes. Stone guy takes a toke and goes, "Whoa!" <laughs> anyway, the film ends with there is a quite graphic uh, doll sex scene earlier on. Oh yeah, and and Team America several years later made headlines for doing the exact same thing but yeah but this yeah. film did Crazy, that it? same thing as a joke in the exact same the same joke basically but no yeah. one yeah. no one sort of picked up on it here plus it's plot relevant because uh, at the end she she gets she gives birth at the end at the uh... end this film just descends into i mean it's it's a weird silly film and it's quite off the wall to begin with but the last 10 minutes of this film are utter insanity it just loses <laughs> its mind, basically. Yeah. Which, you know, um, it sets the tone for the next one, I guess. Uh, it's uh, fascinating, yeah, just how this got made. Because it's not even like it was hot on the heels of the previous one. It came out like six years later with half the budget. Definitely on the strength of the previous film that this got funding, though. It, it has to be. Six years isn't that long, and the budget is is about half the budget of the previous film. But but this really is this is one of the strangest films ever made. Um, <laughs> it's not quite as weird as Space Jam, but it's it's up there. Does someone want to sum up the plot? Can you? Um, plot. So the previous film ends with. So some people get killed, uh, the dolls end up fighting, turning on each other in a, a, a grave, a policeman guy comes and sees it, and then the charred corpse of Tiffany, the doll, sort of sits up and goes, ah! and then she like gives birth to a weird little baby doll that attacks the policeman with his sharp teeth and like kills him. And this film opens with that child doll in a... Uh, like a circus freak show, traveling freak show. He's been picked up by some British carny who. Uh, no, no explanation how that happened. Well, I think he says no. He does. He explains it. He says like, oh, I was I was passing through this cemetery in America and I found this thing in a grave and there are loaded bodies and I picked it up and they do explain it. He picks him up and looks after him. He keeps him in a cage. He performs an inexplicably popular ventriloquism act to <laughs> legions of fans at a uh, sort of ventriloquism expo or something, who all find his laboured, tired jokes of like, you know, oh, how how do you think I feel? Would your hand up my tuckus? All those sort of laboured jokes, like getting massive laughs. But he... But that, that's it. The, the strength of the act isn't even on the basis of... Wow, I can't see this guy's lips move at all. This is a really good eventual yeah. <laughs> which is which is the advantage of the thing. And he won't be like <laughs> gross and crude enough for the guy's act or something. So he and he doesn't like how mean the guy is trying to make him be, and he ends up killing the guy and escaping. But it's sort of a he doesn't mean to kill him, does he? It's kind of a because he's he's set up as a character that's quite kind and gentle and averse to murder mm -hmm. he goes searching for his parents who he believes to be japanese because it says made in japan on his arm i never got why, why first of all when did they have made in japan written on them they were made in america for a start we've seen the factory i know that where, that annoyed me where, why does why does he think having made in japan written on him means he's related to them when there's so many millions of products with made in japan written on them because it's a birthmark isn't it how many people have got that birthmark Oh, that's true. I forgot how uh, all birthmarks are hereditary. That makes perfect sense. I've got a birthmark in the shape of Australia on my bum. It doesn't mean I was born in Australia or that my parents are Australian. But your mum has got that same birthmark, so it makes sense, doesn't it? Yeah, but you guys have been educated in a school system rather than kept in a cage fed on fair rats enough. for how That would be fair enough if it turned out it was completely wrong, but it turns out it's completely correct. To be honest, I think it's just there as a weak excuse for some jokes that aren't very funny about where he says sayonara and stuff. 
Yeah, and every time it sort of focuses on it, it goes ding 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 <laughs> like for no for yeah. no reason. Then plot plot what happens? We see they're making a a film adaptation of the or a film based on the real life uh, Chucky doll murder legends, and somehow the the myth behind, or rather the real life events that are dismissed as myth, are being turned into a horror film. Starring starring Jason Fleming in a bizarre cameo <laughs> as yeah. himself playing Santa Claus. And uh and is Jennifer Tilly in the films? Or is that yeah. Is she yeah. And her yeah, manager in... is Hannah from S Club Seven. <laughs> well, I think <laughs> she's a PA scary. rather than a manager. Sorry, yeah, yeah a PA. <laughs> but the when 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 I was um when I was watching these, I was talking to a friend of mine and trying to explain the concept of it. And this is uh I just looked it up because of when you were asking how to explain the film. So this is what I wrote. I put now in the earlier film, Jennifer Tilly was playing a character called Tiffany, who then becomes a doll. In this film, she is playing the character of Jennifer Tilly, a Hollywood actress, although she is still being the voice of the doll. But in the film within the film, the character of Jennifer Tilly, being played by Jennifer <laughs> Tilly, is playing the character of <laughs> Tiffany, who was the person who got put into the doll in the first place. <laughs> I love that. I know a lot of people get really u- upset about that sort of meta folding in on itself kind of stuff, but I love that. <laughs> I think it's great. And and I love Jennifer Tilly in this film. I love that she was so game to just take yeah, the piss yeah. out of herself. Because it's it's quite brutal, frankly, the the jokes oh, at her yeah. expense it's in this film. Not only do not they go for at all. Yeah, not only do they go for the kind of washed up like actor side of it, but they also go for the struggling with a diet, eating like <laughs> yeah. chocolate bars, getting overweight. Like, Using sex as a weapon. Yeah, yeah. It's, uh, um, I've I've forgotten the very opening of the film though, which is this bizarre, overly long POV sequence where this weird little mm-hmm. doll runs around. It's almost like something from Black Christmas or what have you. With this doll kind of going. Yeah. <laughs> the idea is it's like a weird dream the the main uh, kid keeps ha- having, isn't it? The the Chuck. Chucky and Tiffany's kid. Yeah, because one of the main um, plots of the film is that, well, he, I suppose, Glenn, the son of Chucky and Tiffany, is having sort of gender issues um, and doesn't know if he's a boy or a girl because he's got no genitals. Yeah, Glenn or Glenda in a nod to Edward's film of the same name. He's basically a boy, a male, but inside of him is a psychopathic alter ego female. <laughs> Which is a psycho reference. <laughs> yes, yes. All the more reason to love this film. The, it's voiced by Billy Boyd, who apparently yeah. was was going for an English accent. The Scottish slips in there a little bit sometimes. There are a lot of themes about identity in this mm. film. None of them are being very well explored, but they are there. Yeah, and especially with the whole thing, they're, they're trying to transport themselves into different bodies. They literally try to become different people who already have lives. And 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 she really wants to be Jennifer Tilly because she sort of sees that as a as a great thing, uh, even though she was Jennifer Tilly. And we, let's not get into that. But we <laughs> like that. That's there's a lot of interesting things going on there. And then the gender thing is is alongside that. Chucky wants to stay a doll because that's who he's become, and he feels he feels better as that person than when he was a human it, it, there's a lot of really interesting things there that don't get explored which would have been really nice but it, well, there you go it doesn't go anywhere does it so In, instead they uh use a, take, a turkey baster to artificially inseminate jennifer tilly with chucky's sperm which is uh interesting and and let's not forget that John Waters is in this film as a paparazzo oh, yeah. yes, watching this all unfold is, from outside. Yeah, there's definitely uh, definitely a sign that you're going into eccentric territory when you put John Waters in your film. <laughs> so for anyone unfamiliar with John Waters, go and listen to our episode on Pink Flamingos uh, for a little bit of context. <laughs> He's he's like a snooping photographer. He's like a tabloid journalist. And so he's watching and he sees... Sort of a silhouette. He doesn't realize it's a doll, but he sees a silhouette of Chucky, Chucky masturbating, and he's taking pictures. And at that point, he, I believe the line, if I get it correctly, was something along the lines of, "Sweet Jesus, God bless the little people." <laughs> <laughs> and oh, and that was brilliant. that was the point for me when I was like, "Oh, now it makes sense that they've cast John Waters in this film." I was trying <laughs> to figure it out before, yes. and it was like, "Oh yeah, okay, that, yeah, fair enough." 
<laughs> well, I think just tonally, I mean, you can tell that Don Mancini must be a fan of John Waters or something like the. A lot of the humor in this film is very up John Waters <laughs> street. I think this is as close as we're ever going to get to seeing a slasher film in the style of John Waters. Yeah, and yeah, so and, so there's and John Waters isn't really an actor. Is he? <laughs> well, exactly. This is, I mean, this is mu- more much of an extended cameo, but he must there must have been something that drew him in to mm. go. Oh yeah, that seems like a fun character to play. He but does not, pop up in yeah. things. He's so. not just a jobbing actor, though, is he? But yeah, so there's this ongoing subplot with Jennifer Tilly, actual Jennifer Tilly as herself, Jennifer Tilly, and she's trying to get cast in a biblical epic, because uh, they were hot oh, at the it. time of production, The Passion of the Christ was new and fresh, so biblical epics were, like, hot. So it's Red Man, is it? Yes. Yes. <laughs> Which, Did either like, of you know who he was? But do you think, like, you know when they were putting this film together, and they were like, okay, yeah, yeah we get Jennifer Tilly this, and we need, like, another big sort of Hollywood player who can be the, the other guy. Like, how far down the list do you think Red Man was when they were, <laughs> they, when they were contacting They definitely people? went past like, say, Snoop Dogg, LL Cool, LL cool J, Buster Rhymes. But that's it. You're you're naming like other rappers turned actors. I don't think it even needs to be that. It could have, it could be like you started with Mel Gibson, like he's doing a <laughs> biblical epic. You could play that character quite straight. Well, you know? I mean, on on this note, um, there's a there's a really laboured bad joke in this film where Chucky's driving a car and another car swerves past and the license plate is something like Britney mm. and that they're, they're playing upside did it again like really loudly or something and he rams her off the road or something and goes oops I did it again <laughs> and and you see that you see the woman like give him the finger before she like gets rammed off the road and it it's clearly written as a Britney Spears cameo but then they like yeah. presumably couldn't get her to agree to do it <laughs> So they just do it with a look-alike, which makes it all the more pointless and gratuitous. <laughs> and there's a lot of that in this film. Yeah, I don't know. She did Gold Member the year before. I don't know. I think I think a lot of the jokes in this are quite laboured and corny yeah. and just shit. But equally, there's a lot in here that I really do love. Yeah. I think it's a, such a crazy, interesting film. It's like I, simple things like when Jennifer Tilly's meeting Redman. And she's like, "Oh, hello, Mister Man. Can I call you Red?" I love, so that. Like that. I love that. It's so Thank simple, you, isn't Mr. it? Man. But it works. I love it. <laughs> um, but yeah, the plot with her is that she's trying to convince him to cast her as Mary, as in Virgin the Virgin Mary, Mary, Virgin Mary. Mary. And, the thirteen-year-old Virgin Mary. And he doesn't. Just... He can't buy her in the role. But then she's like, "Well, I'm going to seduce him and." sleep with him so he'll give me the role because he's he's a big fan of hers uh because of oh what's the name of the film they keep referencing where she has a lesbian sex scene bound so he's a big fan of hers because of the lesbian sex scene in that film and so he's kind of willing to basically give her the role in his biblical epic that he's his his directorial debut is going to be this big budget (laughs) biblical epic (laughs) it's just a series of weird things where like red man gets murdered and other people get murdered and jennifer tilly's caught in a oh there's the there's the special effects guy as himself the it, that it's a special effects guy in these films who does all the special effects for the chucky films <laughs> playing himself oh, really? as the special effects guy working on the film within the film well the thing that's the thing it's not it's not that it's like a quite an unusual meta take on the script that's done well it's done quite badly. There's like the, <laughs> yeah. the continuity of the story doesn't quite make sense. It sort of jumps from one thing to another. The characters are just sort of floating about with no real purpose for a lot of it. At the end, Chucky calls it out. He says, "He says this is too fucking stupid," and he he goes off on this sort of <laughs> this rant about how increasingly absurd his adventures have become and how stupid it is and he just wants to go back to basics which <laughs> sets up the next film in a in a way that i don't know if they really intended at the time but it, it's it's very weird and self-aware when i first watched this film i really this was the low point for me uh on the re oh, what what i think i was just like what is going on <laughs> On the rewatch, <laughs> I, guess, I came yeah. back to it and I was like, no, you know what? There's so much to love here. How old were you the first time? Not that old. I, d- I don't know. Yeah, I, c- I can imagine that if I'd seen this when I was like 16 and just like getting into films and getting into horror, I'd have been like, what the hell is this? I, I went through all of the 
the Chucky films that had come out at that point, and this was the last one. And and it, yeah, I've been about seventeen, eighteen, maybe, maybe sixteen. Ah, uh, yeah, yeah. Because seeing it now, it's just like the most wonderful, bizarre bit of. So yeah, I, it, on the rewatch, this has gone up a lot in my ex, uh, my estimations. I, I I think much more highly of it. It's still not a good film, but it's it's a film I'm very glad exists. And uh... <laughs> Alan, I uh, similarly, I, I mean, it's not a good film uh, in in a sort of filmmaking sense, but it's just bizarre enough to be quite fascinating and, and interesting. Um, mm. It's a shame that you know they didn't do like I think it's got the ingredients of quite a, an amazing yeah. film, <laughs> but um, it, they just don't do enough with it. <laughs> I I completely agree. And and again, the puppeteering, I think this might be the peak of puppetry for the franchise even. 2004, yeah. I think the technology had like advanced so much in a way that you just don't see in films, because nowadays everything's done with CGI. But thankfully, mm. this franchise has stuck to its guns and not mm. really done any CGI, which makes sense for the, you know, because they're trying to bring puppets to life. So what would be better than actual animatronic puppets moving? Um, yeah. But a lot of other, in the hands of other producers and directors, I think we would have had lots of CGI Chucky running around. So I'm glad they did it the way they did. Mm. Team America came out the same year as this. And I remember them speaking on, I think the commentary for it, saying that they initially were presented with these very elaborate puppets that had really uh good mouth movements and looked really good and they they said no it's not they're too good it's not funny we need them to look shitter than that and they mm. they had to like downgrade the puppets several <laughs> times before they got what they wanted for the film but i think i think this <laughs> film is a, an example of what they were probably presented with the first time that kind of modern puppet technology and it's just yeah it's just it's just cool that they're still doing it and that carries over into the uh sixth film in the series uh curse of chucky so this the seed of chucky kind of killed the franchise for a while <laughs> yeah but it, but in, in a very much a, a glorious suicide <laughs> But then, you know, ten years later, there's another one. Curse was um, put together as a kind of, right, we we went as far in that direction as we could. I think a lot of people hated Seed of Chucky, I should add. A lot of people did not gel with it. A lot of fans of the franchise didn't gel with it. So there was a real sense of, let's get back to basics. Let's do what the series was. We want a pure horror slasher film. And, and it's people kind of misremembering what the first film was, I think, a lot to be perfectly honest, but there was a real sense of let's mm. get back to a, a basic slasher horror film. Let's try and be actually scary. You know, if Child's Play was a sort of typical low-budget horror kind of straight-to-video sort of film of the 80s, late 80s, this seems like very much the same thing, but of what is yeah. your classic mediocre horror film And that, now, that's something to note. This was the first entry in the series that went straight to video this film is bizarre in that it sets itself up as a standalone reset of the continuity well not continuity but you don't, you can go in blind without having seen any of the other films about halfway through yeah, i thought we were going to get one of those things where it's like you know in halloween h2o they ignore halloween's three through six and i thought that this was just okay well the first film happened then i well, guess well that's it we we, we meet a new protagonist uh played by fiona durif who's wheelchair bound in a house a load of other characters come in and it's all set in this house uh, a Chucky doll sent to her in the mail. It's seemingly a new Chucky doll because uh, it doesn't have any of the scars and what have you that Chucky got mm. in the earlier films. And so you're kind of set to think, right, it's a standalone new thing set in the same world. We'll just kind of go with it. But then halfway through, they do this weird sort of pulling the rug out from under your feet and it turns out, oh no, that Chucky doll was wearing makeup. This is the same Chucky doll. Charles Lee Ray like has beef with these characters. Ch Chucky refers to the the Barkley family being killed. He refers to the Tillies being killed, even though it's been quite yeah. a serious film up until this point. <laughs> it, just willing to acknowledge the lunacy of the previous film. So it's, it's very odd in that <laughs> regard. But I think yeah, it, it, it's a very odd film in in a lot of ways. Well, to the extent of bringing Jennifer Tilly back at the well, end God, as yeah, a the, Tiffany-possessed Jennifer insanity Tilly. insanity beyond... 
Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's a pretty straightforward slasher film in, for the most part, one location, this big house. People being picked off one by one. There's some weird character backstory. As I say, Charles Lee Ray's got a bit of beef with them, so he's come to kill them. Is that basically it? I, 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 I do think there are some interesting twists in here, though. I don't think it's entirely conventional. I think there's... Because the whole thing is Fiona Dourif, Brad Dourif's daughter, who is now the lead character of the series, it seems. There are some interesting twists in here, though. Like, it's kind of set up for a while that the husband of the sister is having an affair with the live-in nanny, and then it turns out it's actually the, oh, the sister who's having the affair with the nanny. Um, <laughs> the old classic nice secret twist. lesbian plot twist. I honestly, I because when you start watching this film, you think, okay, this is just, it's going to go through the motions, it's just going to be a run-of-the-mill, by-the-numbers slasher, and it isn't. It does do interesting things. Like, even with the sister's husband later on, you think that he is going to come in and help save the day, and he's going to be Fiona Durr saving. Maybe they'll even get a romance going mm. between them. When he actually turns on her and starts causing more mm. problems for her than and, um, aiding Chucky unknowingly. But yeah, yeah, and it, not, it turns on her because he thinks she's the killer, and it, that makes sense based on what he's seen. So yeah, <laughs> it does kind of uh, work. And oh, uh, it all works. It all makes sense. I yeah, I I, I really like this film. It, it's probably my second favorite in the whole series. I, I really that doesn't like surprise it. me because on this level of horror film, it, this is the sort of thing you like. <laughs> so yeah, I, yeah. that makes sense. This, this you, is the thing. This, this film came out and. This was the low point of the franchise for me. I hated it because... What? Well, it's it's just... It's just boring. It's just generic, no, boring it slasher bullshit. That's what I thought. On the rewatch, I... It isn't I've... generic. Well, it is. It's, <laughs> it's done to a much no, higher... it isn't. It is. It's done to a much higher standard than most of these films are, but it is No, still... the writing is sharper. It takes more twists and turns. It does unexpected yeah, things. Yeah, but it's, it's still the same generic stuff. It's just done to a much higher standard than they gen- tend to be done to. It's, mm. it's less lazy. Well, I'll tell you, I'll tell you what my, my problem with this film, a uh, problem as such, but... Basically, it just didn't engage me. I wasn't interested. I was bored. I found it very slow paced, particularly in the first half. And that's the thing that the first time I watched it, it just felt like such a noticeable step down in yeah. terms of it. it felt like the straight to video entry. It lost all its personality, all the all the personality that you've got in Chucky, and it's gone. And I will say, on the rewatch, much like Seed of Chucky, I've come round to it a bit. I I. I appreciate that it has a lot more going for it than the initial viewing gave me but i still like it's not better than the other it's better than most of the other sequels i mean even though it's straight to video it looks better than two and three it's not better than the first one it's not better than bride honestly i'd take seed over it i'd probably take the second one over it honestly maybe better than the third one maybe but you but you you're saying that based on the kind of the what the the actual film is the bulk of the film but let's not forget that last sort of eight minutes where we go off into some kind of bizarre oh god no let's get let's get to that at the let's get to that at the end because that deserves <laughs> it i i i like i like that they make an attempt to get back to the sort of the kids playing with this doll is the doll alive or not they they sort of mm. toy with that from the first film again in this one a little bit what did i miss because i have no idea what happened to that kid at the end of the film and then the sort of in the in the pro, pro uh, in the postscript bit she turns up again but i was like where was she in the house i thought she'd been killed or something i i didn't really know what was going on with the kid in the whole sort of finale uh pass <laughs> okay <laughs> <laughs> I like that Charles Lee Ray looks like Tommy Wiseau in all the footage. <laughs> oh my god, doesn't he? I like the bit where the doll keeps telling the kid that God doesn't exist. <laughs> For no obvious reason, just to sort of wind her up. Because <laughs> her grandma's just died. She's like, nah, she's not in heaven. <laughs> she doesn't exist. <laughs> um, one thing I'll say is Chucky himself looks shit in this film. <laughs> Do you guys agree? Uh, like the the puppet just doesn't look right. The animatronics not quite as I, I, good as I was it was. Wondering it's... if it was sort of you know if it is animatronics and they've tried to like touch it up with CG or something because there is something kind of off about it. I don't really. He's know got a, his, his face just looks a bit pudgy and and yeah. wider than it 
used to. I, I just I think it's a new model that they've mm. made, and it just doesn't quite look right. It's mm. I'm not a fan of it. It looks really weird and otherworldly when he's walking in this film and when he's chasing after her. It's this weird clunky motion, and I think I think we're just watching a, a sort of puppet being walked around with all the rigs and things removed with CGI. But mm. it it looks really odd when he's like walking after her and. Anyway, um, so yeah, she. What happens at the end? She kills Chucky, and then we're treated to about ten endings with her being tried in court for all the bodies in the house, like for well, murder. Is yeah, that the idea is she gets put into sort of mental illness custody, I guess, rather than proper prison, because she's she's been found in this house full of murdered people and gone, oh, the doll did it. And so obviously they've gone right. She's cuckoo. It's odd that they include that, but then they they keep going and we get just the most unnecessary bullshit scenes that I just... <laughs> are, are you calling the Jennifer Tilly scenes unnecessary? <laughs> yeah. Oh no, so Jennifer, I love we, it. We get Jennifer Tilly repeating the exact same th- scene from Bride of Chucky where she gets the evidence back from from the police uh, in the exact same way, and then she goes, "Huh? They never learn." And it's like, "Yeah, you've just done the same exact scene. Brilliant." Yeah, well, and, I, I, and then we see her walking, and then she like posts the doll to Andy Barkley, but he's an adult, and he can't act at all. Now he's <laughs> he's a not grown that man. Bad. Come on. He's like, "Hey, mum. <laughs> no, it's fine. It. Oh, and um, Again, so uh, I, when she first killed the policeman, I was like. Oh wait, is this like a midquel thing? Like, was the, are we jumping back into? Well, that's it. And it like, so we're before Tiffany the doll, but then that didn't make sense. And then she starts posting him around again. And it's like, okay, so that's no, that's not what she did. So is this Jennifer Tilly? Well, the idea I think is that because she, Who? yeah, she took Jennifer Tilly's yeah. body and just like dyed her hair and ended up dressing the same as she used <laughs> to, and so she's basically just Tiffany again, but also. Like, I could kind of understand them doing this if they're just setting up a sequel, but they set up, Chucky comes out of a box, he's about to stab Andy Barkley, and then Andy Barkley, like, has a shotgun pointed in Chucky's face and blows his head off and, like, stops him before he has a chance to do anything. So it's, it's, it doesn't, it's completely pointless. It doesn't, it, what I, does it add to the film? It's I, just yeah. a, it's just an extra five minutes that goes nowhere. It's a strange... I, I do get the feeling that like this was maybe filmed and it was like, well, we're not quite sure how to end the film. Maybe we won't have Chucky going after the, the girl um, from earlier on and maybe we'll just end with this. Because uh, it is quite it's, it's post. It's post-credits, I should add, yes, this yes. whole bit. Yeah, it, but it's brilliant. <laughs> Why? All the stuff with Jennifer Dilly, because it's funny. She goes to the post office and they're like, how much is your uh, parcel worth? And she's like, well, oh, you, so you can't put a price on love. It's so, that's so Under 25 yes. then. You're, you're very easy to please, aren't you, Calvin? But anyway, I, I, I do feel like the, the ending might be perhaps retroactively justified by the new film coming out. Yes. Um, Have you seen the trailers? Yeah, I, I wasn't very excited for this because I wasn't very excited for... I wasn't that pleased with uh, Curse of Chucky when I watched it. Then I rewatched Curse of Chucky and I was like, oh, it's all right. And then I watched the trailer and I was like, oh, okay. Mm. Um, so I'm kind of quite looking forward to this new film. Because mm. it seems to be like a weird self-indulgent, but, you know, in, in a way that we as fans or people who've really seen all the films can probably enjoy celebration of the franchise. For, from what I gather, they're bringing back Fiona Dourif's character, but they're also bringing back Jennifer Tilly, but they're also bringing back Andy Barkley, mm. and it's going to be this kind of crossover of all the eras of the franchise, like mm. meeting in a in a in an insane ins- asylum or something. Yeah, and and from what I've heard, the film is a real mind fuck on par with the likes of inception and stuff and i imagine a lot of that is marketing hyperbole but mm. it sounds like they're going in an interesting direction with it i mean it's don mancini again so i don't think these films are ever going to become anything less than kind of watchable and fun 
so yeah if they want to keep pumping them out i'm all for it uh, yeah as long as they can keep up this level of quality i'd be more than happy to have a new one every few mm. years uh i mean mm. I, I would like there to be a, an end at some point like like don mancini is very much the main creative driver throughout the entire series and i think it'd be a shame if it didn't end in some satisfying way before an inevitable reboot remake do you know for a while they were they were trying to get Chucky versus Leprechaun off the ground? Oh god, really? Huh. Yeah, and it it never came together obviously. I don't know how far along that. It was probably just Don Mancini said he'd like to do it, but that would have been interesting. I guess the crossover thing was big for a while like Freddy versus Jason obviously was a big hit and yeah. I think it's probably for the best they didn't do it cuz Leprechaun yeah. is a dreadful franchise that is just shit. <laughs> um they're all dreadful films. I look forward to getting to that someday, actually. I've only seen the first one. Uh, also, very recently, uh, Don Mancini was saying he'd like to make... It, it was very much in a, you know, this will probably never happen and I'm just spitballing ideas, but he said he'd like to make the next one a um, Chucky versus Freddy crossover, if he could ever, like, make it happen in terms of copyright mm. and stuff. Yeah. He was talking about how he has this idea for a... A crossover and where the two of them are like one upping each other, trying to come up with the best kills and things. And again, uh, I, I mean, it might be a way to make a sequel that's interesting after you've done everything else at your disposal. And I'd certainly be mm. interested to see it, but I can't imagine it being good. Yeah, I wouldn't want to see uh, such a thing. But yeah, speaking of 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 future sequels and what have you, um, as always, we've come up with our own ideas for sequels. Uh, have any of us come up with a, a, a crossover pitch? No. Yes! Calvin, what's yours? I guess it, we might as well go straight into your idea if it's hot on the heels of this. So We open my movie, which is cold open. Chuck, we open with Chucky. Okay. He's in a box. He's being mailed. He's muttering to himself. He's muttering, he's finally going to get that Andy Barkley once and for all. He's got the right address this time. He's not going He's not going to get attacked. It, we're going to follow on straight from... Um, uh, curse of Chucky. Um, so he's prepared now. He's not going to let him shoot him. Like as soon as... So he's he's got a plan to jump out and kill the guy before he's got a chance to shoot him. That, that's not a very good plan, because... That's what he did last time. Surely after it happens once, you'll be suspicious of any box big enough to hold <laughs> Chucky. Right. Well, um, Chucky's delivered. Chucky's delivered. And he hears voices outside the box. He hears the wrapping being torn off. Light streams through. And before Chucky has a moment to adjust his eyes, he leaps forward, knifing the figure in the face several times. There's a scream of a woman nearby, a, a middle-aged woman. Well, slightly older than middle-aged. And um, Chucky goes and kills her too. Um, he turns to the figure of the young man he just stabbed in the face. Finally, Andy Barkley is dead. Though, of course, we can't see the face because it's been stabbed. Um, so Chucky, <laughs> Chucky decides that he needs some bourbon and cigars <laughs> to celebrate this. So he goes to search the house for them. Uh, he comes across the room of Andy and presumes that there must be some weed in there somewhere because he's a young man after all. So he goes and rummages around and he can't <laughs> find anything. Isn't um, Andy by this point like about 38? He rummages around, he can't find anything. He looks in the drawers, he looks under the bed. Whoa! So he, so Chucky jumps out of the box and Andy's like puffing on a spliff and he just goes, dude. So um, the last place, the last place that Chucky goes is the toy chest. He opens it up and out pop Woody the Cowboy, Buzz Lightyear, and all the Toy Story friends. <laughs> so, and then we get the title. Chucky story. Yes, Chucky <laughs> mailed himself to the wrong Andy. <laughs> Jennifer Tilly. Je Jennifer Tilly had put the wrong zip code on the box, so oh, uh, he actually killed Andy from the Toy Story films. Um, <laughs> and now Chucky must convince the Toy Story gang to accompany him on a road trip to the house of the proper Andy Barkley, uh, which is a few states over, because obviously every Toy Story film is a road trip film, so that's what we're having here. So that's the opening. The rest of the film is not well planned out by me. Is this, um, is this a live action film with like creepy animatronic <laughs> Woody and Buzz, or is it animated? <laughs> well, I figure that um, CG technology has come far enough that we can sort of have it all animated but try to pass it off as live action at the start and just get some really realistic okay. uh, <laughs> rendering in so, <laughs> so that just to confuse people um, right. 
Now, the rest of the film plays out. Um, Chucky's trying to keep his murderous tendencies and his role in Andy's disappearance secret from Woody and Buzz because he needs their significant road trip expertise to get across the country. We have adventures and hijinks along the way uh, when eventually everyone will find out what Chucky did and they team up with Andy Barkley to defeat him. Anyway, we have an emotional journey in here for Woody, Buzz and Andy because it turns out that Andy, after all this time, has been traumatised by the, even the very sight of a, an action figure or a toy since his encounters with Chucky in the past. So getting to know Woody and Buzz really helps him overcome his fears. Um, and the toys find a mutually loving new owner in Andy Barkley, which means that Woody doesn't have to um, change the name that's on the uh, sole of his shoe. The end. <laughs> well, what happened to Chucky? He dies. <laughs> okay. <laughs> shall, I, shall I do mine? Yeah. My pitch is you do a new one. And you make it a full-blown horror comedy, because that's clearly what's best for the franchise. Because it's never going to be legitimately scary, and it's always been silly, just inherently. And it's now, like, absurd with the continuity, so you'd have to reboot it outright for it to, like, really work um, in a serious context. So, So you hire... Hire some new people to work with. You know, keep Don Mancini on, but maybe get some, like, proper sitcom writers on board to uh, do some proper jokes for him and stuff, because that's probably the weak, uh, the weaker area, I think, of his <laughs> comedic ones, is just the actual gags aren't necessarily that good. Mm. Um, get a decent director on the helm. Well, I was thinking, get the get the script for Scream 5 that never got made and just make that, or change the names to, like, Chucky... <laughs> That could follow on from Seed of Chucky, right? But but I've got a broad idea. So my idea is it's Christmas. There's uh, a new toy that all the kids are going mad for because uh, because you know they're always going mad for something. Uh, and these things are called fluff ants, and they're the new craze. Hang on, they're called what? Fluff ants. Fluff ants. Fluff ants. <laughs> fluff ants. What's wrong with that? I don't know, I'm just trying to figure out where this is going. Fluffins. Um, <laughs> They're just a, it's just a name. They're just a toy. Okay. Right. <laughs> fluff ants. They're just they're just like fluffy tribble things. It must be really hard to come up with a fad <laughs> that is like Believable and conceivable. <laughs> when I mean, you know, when the best we can do is fluff ants. Well, well, when fidget spinners are <laughs> like what kids actually get into these days. I don't want that shit in my film. <laughs> Skylanders, <laughs> fuck's sake. Fluff They're called ants. fluff ants. Okay, so sorry, sorry. Go on. What's what? What happens F- with the fluff ants? F l u f f a n t s. Fluff ants. Fluff ants. Yeah. Fluff ants. Fluff ants. Yeah. Yeah. Go on, I'm, I'm okay with it. Okay. Now remember Dr. Death, the voodoo practitioner from the first film? I didn't yes. know he was called Dr. Death. I don't remember. I didn't really pick up on that. But yeah, I'll take your word for it. Well, it turns out his younger brother has been out to avenge his, uh, his brother's death for the last 30 odd this years. And, this uh, is Billy Death, is it? He keeps finding leads here and there. But uh, I mean, yeah, but they, they, they keep leading to Charles Lee Ray, who of course is dead. It, it doesn't really add up. And every time he gets somewhere pursuing it, the lead kind of stops in its tracks and he has to start again. Because, you know, there's just a massacre. Everyone dies. Uh, at one point, he links the uh, everything to Tiffany. And he thought he was about to solve what happened, avenge the guy, but uh, you know she she mysteriously disappeared and died. And he, he trundles on, trying to track down his brother's killer, and he fears a greater evil's at work. Mm. And uh, obviously, Doctor Death in his time with him taught him a great deal of uh, of voodoo. So he's he's got you know he's got a a, a good knowledge of uh, magic, even if it's not as powerful as uh, it might be. But then Tiffany is suddenly resurrected in in Jennifer Tilly's body, uh, which makes no sense because Doctor Death tracked down and found uh, Tiffany's human corpse, and he's like, "What? What's going on there?" Then she he's, and and it's mysteriously just after Jennifer Tilly died, and, and there's all these weird murders. So it's it's hmm. this weird thing. So he he's able to kind of realize that the doll has something to do with it because it's tied to so much of the evidence he basically realizes there's no means for him to get close to 
this evil in his current form, so he has to go undercover. So he gets a fellow voodoo practitioner, who I was thinking could be played by Kevin Smith. <laughs> Seems like the right sort of level to go for, the right kind of guy. I, I thought when he was going to go undercover, I thought he was going to like make himself look like a doll, like stick plastic to his face and things. <laughs> <laughs> So Kevin Smith, think think Kevin Smith in Die Hard 4, that's kind of what we're going yeah. with here, but less annoying. Mm-hmm. So yeah, he basically puts his human body on ice and transfers his soul into the new hot toy, the Fluffin. Oh, wait, 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 wait. When he does this, if Kevin Smith helps him do the voodoo, can when it's all wor- it all works, Kevin Smith takes a, a drag on a giant and goes, Whoa! <laughs> 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 Meanwhile, some kids in an old-timey orphanage open up a mysterious package that's been sent to them, a good guy doll. And uh, they go through the motions, people being picked up one by one, some kid doesn't trust it. And and Charles Lee Ray needs to kill a kid so that Tiffany can inherit some vast fortune or something. I don't fucking know. <laughs> Some bullshit like that. Um, I'll let Don Mancini worry about that. The uh, the Fluffant shows up. What we get is a toy showdown in the mould of classic crossover movies. It's Chucky versus the Fluffant, which is basically a Furby, <laughs> I should add at this point. Oh. Um, uh, so Chucky tries to take it on with but it's like an traditional ant. weaponry. No, it's just, a, just a fluffy thing. I think this is a very a blatant thing. and obvious uh, merchandise cash-in attempt. You're cr- trying to create mm. a toy line so that you can sell it to the kids. It's cheap. It's, you're, you're a corporate whore. Oh, yeah, because those good guy dolls were flying off the shelves in 1988. <laughs> they they try and have a fight with uh, traditional weaponry, but the Fluffin has a degree of magic at its disposal. They battle across town, chasing this kid on Christmas Eve. Uh, they end up in a big toy shop that's closed for the night. Uh, one thing leads to another, and they end up fighting with all the toys, super soakers filled with lighter fluid, <laughs> darts, remote control cars covered in razor blades, like a- anything mm. you can think of. They make their way to the hot new toy aisle, and there's a shitload of new good guy dolls that are being relaunched, and a shitload of new Furbies. And, uh Not Furbies, Fluffins. <laughs> <laughs> Whoops. <laughs> uh, shitload of new Fluffins. And uh, they both cast some basic voodoo spells to commandeer control, so they've both got an army of toys, mm. and all at once they go they go to war with each other. So you've got hundreds of good guy dolls voiced by Brad Dourif fighting hundreds of Fluffins, and they they like grind each and every instance of each other down to a pulp except for the last two who um are still battling the last good guy doll manages to corner the kid with a shiv fashioned from another good guy doll's arm and the fluffant's about to creep up behind and and kill it with a a mallet or something uh to end everything once and for all but then at the last minute kevin smith shouts clear and he resurrects the guy brings him back because uh, it was as long as he could like leave it before his body was going to die, mm. right? All right. Yeah. And he's 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 pissed off, so he rushes to the toy shop to try and save things. But when he gets there, it turns out that the kid overpowered Chucky and managed to defeat him mm. uh, on his own. The end. And then Doctor Death Two, the the brother, goes home and sits down to a, a nice Christmas glass of voodoo scotch. <laughs> it's interesting we've both got that in our pitch, Calvin. But. Yeah, that's curious. He turns on the uh, the Christmas hooter nanny with with uh, Jules Holland, <laughs> and uh, <laughs> really popular he's doing... over in the states. He is. He's 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 just launched a spin off of his popular New Year hooter nanny despite, in the UK. Despite the time difference, <laughs> he sighs a breath of relief. Then the little kid wraps a piece of tinsel around his neck from behind and strangles him. Oh my god! And because Chucky finally got his body into a his soul into a real life child, and he stabs the guy, walking off, leaving him dying. And uh, Charles Lee Ray now inhabits a human body once more. Mm. Uh, but but Doctor Death isn't dead, yeah. and he pulls himself over to the voodoo Christmas tree and opens the presents that he's got. And it, Kevin Smith, as a joke, sent him a good guy doll. <laughs> 
He starts chanting and a cloud forms in the sky. He, he starts preparing to transfer his soul, setting up a sequel where the good guy doll is actually the good guy uh, and the human child is the villain. Oh, and they're going to have to to do a kind of inverse child's play. Mm, that's quite a nice twist. So there you go. <laughs> I like the, I liked that Chucky finally gets into a kid. I was just thinking, like, it's a shame they've never done that, even if it's, like, temporary and then he gets put back in or whatever. Because it'd be great to see a kid running around going, I'm going to fucking kill you, you bitch, and stuff like that. <laughs> well, that's it. I thought, I thought it'd be quite a nice new thing, direction they could do with the franchise, the, the child actually murdering everyone. Yeah, that's good. And I, I think it's in keeping with the series tonally insofar as it sort of continues the continuity and builds on bringing back another old mm-hmm. character and bit of lore and stuff. It, I wouldn't be surprised if something similar ended up happening down the line. Mm. I don't think they'd have a big army of toys fighting it's each other. Nice, that's a great yeah. concept, though. It's the sort of thing that would up the ante a little bit for a sequel, you know? I, I mean, I guess um, Glenn Glenda got into a real kid at the end of Seed of Chucky, but it's not quite the same, and you only see it yeah, for like a, don't, a minute. Don't explore it there. That that leaves you, Alan. What's your okay? Um, I've gone with the the spirit of like not really worrying about continuity or what the hell it is. So don't try and fit this into the the previous narrative too closely. <laughs> okay. Because it might not work. But anyway, so my... And I want to. Uh, well, well, we'll make it work, Rin. My Chucky sequel is called Chucky Ducky Quack Quack. Um... <laughs> it's called what? <laughs> <laughs> what did you... <laughs> what did you call it? <laughs> it's called... <laughs> I'm gonna... It's I'm called... Sorry. Chucky Ducky Quack Quack. <laughs> Is what? I... <laughs> is this something I don't understand? Is this a, ga- a reference I'm not getting? Yeah, I think so. I mean, the title the title was mainly for Soul's benefit, I will admit. <laughs> I oh. got the reaction I wanted, so I'm happy with that. <laughs> oh, God, uh, hamburger. It, do- it, does, it does tie in, kind of, but let's not, don't worry about the title, really. Oh. <laughs> First of all... The kind of gimmick of this film is that it, it all takes place on TV, by which I mean uh, everything that happens we see through the lens of a TV show, right? Oh, okay. So, but the idea that is is that um, Chucky has been caught and he's in prison, <laughs> right? So <laughs> while he's there, he ends up appearing in a, a Louis Theroux documentary, looking at America's most dangerous criminals. <laughs> that first footage we see. Is from the documentary, so like I say, it's, it, we're seeing something that's on TV. Do you know what I mean? Mm. And so yeah, so <clears throat> we can use this to re- re-establish the character of Chucky because Louis Theroux will give us a bit of backstory. Like, oh, this is uh, this is Charles Lee Ray is in the body of a doll. Yeah, you're you're stabbing me. Is that something you do? <laughs> anyway, so. The documentary it goes down very well, and and, and Chucky is kind of a, a particular highlight. Is he gets noticed? Isn't it- isn't it weird that Louis Theroux hasn't done any cameos as himself in British comedy yet? Yeah, it's the sort of thing he'd turn up in Shaun of the Dead or something like that. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, he's 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 very good mates with Adam and Joe. He grew up with them, you know, yeah. so you'd think he'd be... Maybe he's got too much dignity? <laughs> What's the... <laughs> Integrity? Uh... I mean, he, he, he did a cameo in that gay porn film, but... <laughs> The documentary go down really well. Chucky kind of gets back into the public light again because of this, because he, you know, in the in the in the show, he's like he's got his quick wit, he's got this kind of charming personality, he's he's cracking jokes all the time, and so off the back of this, he gets invited to take part in a new TV show called called Prison Idol, uh, which is of course a talent show for prisoners, the winner of which receives a full presidential pardon. <laughs> um, Chucky, his talent, well, he does a stand-up act. He does a stand-up comedy. And um, <laughs> mostly consisting of like observational humour about what it's like when you're trying to kill someone. So it could be like, uh, oh, you know, what, you know what it's like when you're, you're trying to kill someone with your wife and then she just wants to go shoe shopping, right? <laughs> Women, am I right? <laughs> Chucky, <Chuck it, Chuck laughs> So... Uh, <laughs> Calvin speaks for the listener. 
Is this whole thing something that you were both an in joke for the two of you? Pretty much, yeah, yeah. Uh, okay. I'll, I'll show it no, to you when not... we finish. But, yeah. but it's a stand-up comedian, yeah, basically. Yeah, he's a stand-up comedian, and his thing is, he, there's a whole slew of these stand-up comedians where they just say a thing. Hamburger Jones, who's just like brilliant. He he just does jokes, but at the end of each joke, he just goes hamburger. <laughs> <laughs> Hamburg. Hamburg. It, it doesn't make any sense when he just says it. Every, it's like a nervous tick. It's bizarre. Yeah, yeah it's just guy, like it's part of their rhythm or something. Like. Yeah, and there's another guy who does it, but he just goes shucky ducky quack quack. At the end, like when he's done talking. He's called, so, he calls himself shucky ducky. you hate it. When you go to the bathroom... Shucky ducky wag wag. It's oh, it's amazing. Well, that's not really relevant to the plot at all. Like it was just because I was doing him as a stand-up comedian. I was I just made it, it was just this thing. But I just I did it for sort of Saul's benefit, really. <laughs> 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 okay, so <clears throat> I haven't really got an ending for this, but I've got I've got a middle bit. So yeah, Chucky's doing his stand-up act that's kind of observational humor. Murderers love it, they get it. Uh, and but his his kind of plain his plain speaking he's got a very candid style where he'll just say whatever the hell he think he thinks it really captures the nation's imagination. So he's favourite to win the show. It kind of like his major competition is like uh, maybe like a kindly old man who's trained a crow to do tricks. You know, mm-hmm. that's something like that. But like I say, all this stuff is just stuff we're seeing on TV. So we're just seeing the TV show of Prison Idol like, as it goes out. Mm. But then eventually we'll get to the live shows and that's where we can start messing about with a bit more because it's live, anything can happen because we can kind of go a bit mm. kind of crazy. Um, we could have a bit where a show like Prison Idol is going to have controversy and you could have like the previous victims of these people like protesting and the, the head protester could be Jennifer Tilly perhaps, uh, <laughs> by which it would be the actress Jennifer Tilly played by Jennifer Tilly. I love but it. Has she been possessed by Tiffany? I don't know. I, I, I'm not yeah. sure... Maybe that's that could come out at the end, and she's actually working for him. Something uh, I don't know. That could that could be the ending. Basically, you know, uh, the, the, there's going to come a point where he starts killing the other contestants, or or perhaps it isn't him, and it is, turns out to be Jennifer Tilly all along, or something. But then, you know, when we got the live shows, he could he could take one of the camera teams hostage and like forces them to broadcast as he's going around doing things. I don't know. He, he's got to do kill Simon Cowell or something. I, he's just you know something like that. I'm, I, I haven't really got an ending, like I say, because <laughs> I just kind of had this concept but i i haven't established a hero who can beat him which is well what, which is what we always have louis through yeah louis through comes back can we can we no can we yeah louis through's like oh well i've i have to i have to stop him i have to beat him i started <laughs> this i gave him a platform louis through just keeps asking him questions and questions and questions until chuckley finally breaks down and confesses that all the bad things he's ever done was because his mother didn't hug him enough as a child. <laughs> and then and then they cry and, you know, he gives himself in. Nice climactic hmm. ending. <laughs> I, well, I like the name. <laughs> I like the bit with Jennifer Tilly. I, I was going to call mine um, Ghost of Chucky, by the way. I didn't mention that. I thought oh, that'd that's... be, like, in keeping with the, the vibe. Yeah that, yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. And I think I think one day they should do House of Chucky and it's... Following on from Alan's, like a uh, 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 Chucky runs for president, <laughs> yeah. you get a lot of mileage out of that. Uh, yeah, Chucky in the White House. Yeah, not even he runs for president, just Chucky in the White House. Jennifer Tilly's like got elected as president, <laughs> and Chucky like, <laughs> has to <laughs> do something about it. <laughs> I can see that. Happening. What other ones are there? Abbott and Costello meet Chucky. <laughs> 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 I like these films. I like these films. Yeah, good series. Good Halloween nonsense. Shitty yes, and this isn't yes. even our Halloween episode. <laughs> so, <laughs> shuck it, duck it, <laughs> shuck it, duck it, whack, whack. Uh, should we call it quits then? Then, <laughs> should we? Hamburger. Should we stop recording then? Hamburger. There you go. That was Child's Play. As always, head over to our website, dimreturns.com. Check out the episode page if you haven't already. You can see our actual ratings out of 10, each of us for each of the films. You'll, you'll see a score, how they all rank. You can leave comments. As always, spread the word, and thank you for listening. As I say, 
This marks the start of a, a sort of unofficial horror season for Halloween, given that it's now October. You've had Child's Play. Next week we're doing a horror franchise with even more entries than Child's Play. See you bye!